Why did people need radioactive toothpaste? Why were animals equipped with gas masks during World War I? How could 19th century solar engines have changed the future? And how could 20th century flying cars have transformed transportation? Welcome to Untold Story. In this episode, we'll talk about five absolutely incredible inventions from the past that were once a reality. Not long ago, Incredible Mechanisms published an article about an unusual unicycle, the half motorcycle from Rhino Motors, a futuristic technology already here today. However, if we dive into history, this concept is far from new. Back in 1884, an unknown inventor proposed a similar design. A drawing of this possibly never realized device called the unicycle was published in the book Inventions of the Victorian Era. Later, similar designs appeared in different parts of the world, initially with a pedal drive, followed by device devices with various types of engines that powered both the wheel itself and air propellers. There was even a design for a mono carriage, a one-wheeled carriage that could be pulled by a horse. But today, our story is about David Sislagi and the company he founded, Motorowota. Motorowota was founded by David Sislagi, a former electrician who in 1923 created the prototype of a unicycle and patented it in France in 1924. In his patent, Sislagi laid out the principles of the tilting mechanism and defined the basic design which he used for about 10 years. It included a steering wheel, three rollers for stabilizing the outer wheel, and a small single-cylinder air-cooled engine. Sislagi's partner, according to French advertising of that time, was Italian Giuseppe Govitosa. Their names were often mentioned together. There were two articles published in the press about the outstanding features of this unicycle, one in Roman publications in 1927 and another in Parisian ones in 1932. Likely, these were demonstration shows that attracted public attention. There were at least two or three versions of the device, all with the same basic layout. One model had a diameter of 1.5 meters and used a 175 cubic centimeter engine with a three-speed gearbox. It was also noted that this device was the first of its kind to feature steering control. A 1931 photograph shows a biker named Gerties, who was likely one of the few owners of this unique vehicle, not its inventor as many mistakenly believe. In total, according to sources, various people, from individual enthusiasts to large entrepreneurs worked on these unusual machines until 1937. During this period, at least six similar designs were patented, some with gasoline and others with electric engines. Moreover, there were even models designed for children. However, with the onset of the war, interest in these developments faded and they were soon forgotten. We're mostly familiar with flying cars from science fiction films. I'm sure most people don't know that soon after the Wright brothers built the first aircraft in 1903, people were already envisioning a future where cars would fly through the air. In America, the fascination with flying cars began with the 1921 Tampier Avian automobile model created by René Tampier. He dreamed of inventing a universal means of transportation that could drive on the road and, when necessary, take off into the sky. This two-seater biplane was made of wood and equipped with a 300 horsepower engine. To allow for convenient road travel, its wings folded backward and wheels were attached to the tail section, powered by an auxiliary gasoline engine. However, this was not the ideal time to realize such ambitious ideas, and no one took the concept seriously. Tampier himself focused solely on developing airplanes. The Flying Ginny, as the inventor affectionately called his flying vehicle, was an experimental craft that stood out for its uniqueness. Simultaneously resembling a car, helicopter, auto gyro, and motorcycle. Jesse Dixon's design was powered by a small 40 horsepower engine and steering was done with foot pedals that controlled the tail rotor. This vehicle was thought to reach speeds of up to 100 miles per hour, 160 kilometers per hour, and could move forward, backward, turn, and even hover in the air. The Convair car model resembled a car with wings attached and that's exactly what it was. The airplane elements could be detached in case the road suddenly ended. Ended. The Convair car, Model 118, was not a fictional spy film invention. Its reality was confirmed by a test flight in California in November 1947. This concept was developed by Theodore P. Hall for the Consolidated Volte Aircraft Company. A one-hour demonstration flight ended prematurely due to low fuel, and an emergency landing caused the destruction of the car and damage to the airplane wings. Everyone survived, except for the dream of the Convair car. The Aero car, with its folding wings, was perhaps the first 
first promising vehicle of this kind. The unusual flying vehicle even received an official US flying certification, and it seemed that, in the near future, flying cars would firmly take their place in the garages of ordinary families. However, what physics allowed, economics could not fulfill. Mass production proved economically unfeasible. The prototype was successfully tested in 1966, and its top speed reached 60 miles per hour on land and 110 miles per hour in the air. Disney even created a character in the movie Planes inspired by this device. The history of attempts to use renewable energy sources is truly fascinating. For example, the work of Auguste Mouchot and his assistant Abel Pifray, the first people who began to create and attempt to apply solar thermal concentrators in practice. Auguste Mouchot, a mathematics teacher at a French school, developed a device and conducted a series of experiments on solar energy conversion between 1852 and 1871. His efforts were not in vain. The tests showed impressive results, which attracted the attention of the French government which allocated a special grant for further research. Of course, Auguste Mouchot didn't start his research from scratch. His work was based on the studies of Horace Benedict de Saussure, the first designer of the solar stove in 1767, and the inventor of the pareliometer Claude Pouillet in 1838. Since Mouchot's invention relied on sunlight, his research was conducted in French Algeria. After the work was completed, the device had to be disassembled and transported to Paris for demonstration at the 1878 World's Fair. There it caused a real sensation, impressing the jury with its ability to create ice using solar energy and rightfully receiving a gold medal. Unfortunately, the drop in coal prices, driven by the effectiveness of trade agreements and free trade agreements with the United Kingdom, led to Mouchot's solar machine being sidelined and deemed unnecessary. Funding for the work was cut soon after Augustus' triumph at the World's Fair. However, his assistant Abel Pifra continued the work and in 1882 demonstrated a solar-powered printing press in the Tuileries Garden. Despite the cloudy conditions on the day of the demonstration, the machine printed 500 copies of Le Journal du Soleil per hour. The newspaper contained materials specially written for and about the tests. The discovery of radium played a crucial role in the development of science and led to the very concept of radioactivity. However, the finding was quickly exploited by charlatans. Armed with the theory of the benefits of radiation, they began adding radium to cosmetics, food, and drinking water. But as we know today, radiation mostly has a destructive effect and is used by doctors only in controlled doses for treating tumors. Radioactivity was discovered by scientists at the very end of the 19th century. In 1896, French researcher Henri Becquerel discovered that uranium salts emitted rays with much greater penetrating power than X-rays. Since these radiations were not caused by external factors, it became evident that radioactivity was an internal property of the material itself. This phenomenon sparked great interest among scientists, who sought to understand the nature of the emitted rays and discover other radioactive elements. Among the researchers was Marie Curie, who focused her attention on studying nasturin, the main uranium ore, and torbernite, a uranium containing mineral. A key role in these experiments was played by the highly sensitive electrometer, invented by Pierre Curie, Marie's husband. Thanks to this instrument, it was established that the higher the radioactivity of the sample, the better the surrounding air conducted electricity. In the course of the research, Marie Curie discovered that nasturin had radioactivity four times greater than uranium itself. This indicated the presence of an unknown chemical element responsible for this property. To isolate this element, Marie and Pierre Curie conducted complex physical and chemical experiments, grinding the ore, dissolving it in acids, and subjecting the solutions to various reactions in an attempt to obtain a concentrated precipitate. However, significant results were not achieved until they began processing hundreds of kilograms of ore. The concentration of the sought-after substance was extremely low. In the summer of 1898, they finally managed to isolate the compound of the new element, which Marie named polonium, in honor of her homeland, Poland. Chemically, it resembled bismuth, but since bismuth was absent in nasturin, isolating the new element posed no difficulty. Now, here are a few crazy health remedies from the last century based on radiation. Radiator, radioactive water for enhancing potency. 
Yes, that was the actual name. I didn't make a typo. Raditer was made up of one third distilled water and two thirds radium. This concoction was sold as an energy drink, pain reliever, remedy for male potency, and an immune system stimulant. The Wonder Remedy was created in 1918 by a dismissed medical student who falsely claimed to be a doctor of medical sciences. Raditer was an expensive product available only to wealthy individuals. One of its devotees was Eben Byers, an athlete, billionaire, and firm supporter supporter of this remedy. Initially, Raditor was prescribed to him by a doctor to relieve pain after an arm injury. However, the choice of the medicine was not accidental. The doctor received a commission for recommending it. Eben took Raditor for several years, likely due to its effects. It acted as an energizer and enhanced potency. However, Raditor had a serious side effect. It contained radioactive radium. Long-term use led to severe poisoning, causing serious complications, and eventually, Byers died. After his death, Raditor was officially banned. Radioactive toothpaste Doramod, your teeth will shine in the dark. This toothpaste was produced in Germany from the 1920s until the beginning of World War II. It contained thorium, which gave it a weak radioactive property. It was believed that this element had antibacterial effects, strengthened teeth, and aided in whitening them. An interesting historical fact, during World War II, Germany confiscated all the thorium stocks from occupied France. Many countries believed it was needed for uranium enrichment in the creation of atomic weapons. However, it was later discovered that thorium was used in the production of toothpaste. As is well known, Imperial Germany was the first country in the world to use chemical weapons on a large scale during warfare. This occurred on April 22, 1915 on the Western Front when the German army launched a massive chlorine attack against the French, releasing about 170,000 tons of chlorine from 5,730 cylinders into the wind. As a result of this attack, over 15,000 people were affected, with more than 5,000 dying. During World War I, chemical weapons were used in vast quantities. A total of 180,000 tons of chemical munitions of various types were produced, of which 125,000 tons were used on the battlefield, including 47,000 tons by Germany. Over 40 types of chemical agents were tested in combat. Overall, the casualties from chemical weapons are estimated at 1.3 million people. By the way, it was during the heyday of chemical weapons that Adolf served in the army. During that time, every soldier was issued a gas mask. According to Alexander Fry, who served along Alongside Adolf in the same infantry regiment, the future leader of the German army was ordered to trim his mustache because it did not meet the safety standards. The thick facial hair prevented the gas mask from sealing properly, and a poorly fitted mask could lead to death. As for animals, horses, mules, and donkeys were used during World War I to transport weapons, supplies, and food. Between 1916 and 1918, when chemical weapons were used in the conflict, 2,200 horses were hospitalized and 211 died. Dogs also played a significant role. The Germans used about 30,000 dogs on the Western Front, while the Allies kept about 20,000. Since horses were the main means of transportation and draft power for the Red Army during the 1941 to 1945 war in 1928, special horse gas masks were introduced to protect horses from gas attacks. These were based on the designs of Western armies, particularly German and French models. The large gas mask, with a massive charcoal filter, was placed over the animal's muzzle and fastened with leather straps and buckles, allowing the horse to breathe in toxic air for up to four hours. Gas masks were made not only for horses, but also for dogs and even messenger pigeons. Horse gas masks first appeared during World War I, when gas attacks became widespread. Interestingly, horses could stay in a gas mask for a long time, but dogs could not as the air inside the mask became very hot. The ancestors of these gas masks were simple bags made of straw. That was how horses were protected from chemical attacks in the early stages of World War I later. Filters made from fabric soaked in special solutions were used in horse gas masks, and by World War II, gas masks with charcoal filters were developed for horses. The instructions for the horse gas mask, KSPF-1, with a charcoal filter issued in 1941 describe its design, how to put it on the horse, and the storage conditions when not in use. In 1932 to 1933, a gas mask for dogs was adopted. Its design was improved 
over five years. Initially, the filter box was attached to the mask, but later, a better dog gas mask was developed with the filter box fixed on the back or side. With this gas mask, combined with a protective, gas-resistant coat made of rubberized fabric, the dog looked like some sort of alien. Canvas masks for oxen and cows were also produced, as oxen were often used as draft animals, and cows were raised for food for the Red Army. Thousands of such gas masks were stored in warehouses of the Ministry of Defense until the 21st century. However, by the early 2010s, they became unusable and lost practical significance after the Chemical Weapons Convention came into force. As a result, the remaining stockpiles were destroyed. What invention surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments. And if you want to learn more, don't forget to subscribe. Science never stops surprising us, and we'll definitely be back with new shocking discoveries.